Hello, my dear friends. How is it going? I hope I find you all in good health and safe and sound. And I mean it. I hope you are taking care of yourselves. Um, well, I'm Ari Ferger, and today I'm going to talk about the role of the shaman within its community when it comes to the process of killing animals, eating them, the process of hunting and the consumption of salts. Particular behaviors the human community wants to avoid doing, but sometimes it is forced to do in order to have sustenance in extreme environments where hunting becomes the only means of survival. Still, in animistic societies, the act of hunting isn't taken lightly because within the animistic understanding, all manner of living creatures possess, at the very least, a spirit, a soul, a life essence, call it what you will, and animals are considered kin and in many instances considered alike to humans. So the killing and death of an animal isn't taken lightly, but sometimes humans find themselves in situations where the killing of an animal kin is necessary to ensure the survival of the human community. And so the shaman enters as both the mediator between animals and humans, but also coming up with solutions to minimize the harm and damage that follows the taking of a life. Uh, as I've expressed on the previous video, uh, I think it is important to remember that there, there isn't um, th there is no such thing as a um, shamanic religion and shamanism isn't a religion. Therefore, a shaman isn't a sort of priest presiding over a religion or even being the central figure of a religious creed providing religious teaching. But rather, shamanism is an expression of behaviors that goes in line with an animistic worldview. Even though certain actions and behaviors within shamanism are quite similar and there are certain lines of thought that follow an equal pattern because animism lies within the core of moral principles, laws, belief systems, culture, language and perceptions of life of indigenous peoples. Not every shaman of an animistic indigenous community will behave in the same manner. A shaman is, and using the term shaman here as a general term for a better understanding, a shaman is a performer of actions towards a community. According to the necessities of the community, the shaman will adapt its behavior towards those same necessities. Therefore, shamanism in itself is a performance for the community. So what the shaman does is according to the community in which the shaman is inserted or according to the community that seeks the shaman for aid and to solve problems and to act on particular circumstances that go beyond the capacities of the human community when it comes to deal with non-human persons of the world. In this way, the shaman behaves according to the animistic worldview of both the community but also of the culture in which the shaman was born into and has more familiarity with. So shamanism is an employment of actions and behaviors that sprouts from animism. Therefore, the shaman itself is the product of an animistic worldview and the necessity to have a mediator between persons, right? For this very reason, the actions and behaviors of a shaman are adapted, reshaped and designed according to the animistic belief systems. As such, since within animism the multiplicity of possibilities on both an individual and a collective level are infinite, therefore the shaman will also have a multiplicity of behaviors that aren't always regular and predetermined, but in fact become unique according to the momentary need. However, the way animistic indigenous societies view animals seems to be something almost always with the same perception that animals are akin to humans and they also possess a spirit. Even though out of necessity sometimes humans kill animal kin, this is seen as something wrong that may cause a lot of damage and unwanted harm and even death upon the human community but also upon the environment. So here's where the shaman enters to try to mitigate and even avert the negative consequences of taking a life even if it is for the sake of sustenance and survival. So let us, let us explore this, please.
In our westernized societies, under the religious model of Abrahamic belief systems, there's the tendency to dehumanize societies, leading to a far greater exploitation of land and resources and enslavement of peoples. Therefore, if humanity is capable of exploiting, enslaving and destroying its own species, it will also see itself as being above every creature that isn't us, that isn't human. Therefore, animal kin is seen as a product to be exploited and consumed, soulless, spiritless, without consciousness and sentience even. However, this is not the case for indigenous societies or people with an indigenous worldview and lifestyle who are very much connected to the laws of the land and the cyclical rhythms of the natural environment. Within animistic societies, it becomes an inherent peril of life, the killing and consumption of animals. Because when there's the necessity to eat animals, it's not just the thought of eating the flesh of their corpses, but the constantly present idea that when such is necessary, it is a fact that the consumption of animals consists entirely in the consumption of souls as well. This is a fact, this is knowledge, and this is a truth for indigenous peoples, that all the creatures that are killed and destroyed for food or to make clothes is the killing and destruction of sentient beings who also possess a soul like we do. Just because a body is lifeless and destroyed, this, this, does, the, this does not destroy the soul and, and the soul therefore does not perish with the body. So there's the necessity to propitiate the souls of the killed and destroyed persons, lest they seek revenge on the human community for taking away their bodies. This is, without a doubt, one of the major problems that assail the minds of animists on a daily basis and pushes animists to seek ways to avoid the revenge of the spirits of those who have untimely and abruptly been robbed of their bodies. The eating and wearing of the physical remains of persons that have been killed can also constitute disrespect if certain actions aren't taken to not only propitiate such spirits, but also to appease their own consciousness and allow them to move in the opposite direction of the path of revenge. It's not just a question of bodies possessing souls, but also animal kin are souls. The souls survive the death of their body. Um, as you might imagine, this constitutes a series of problematic outcomes in which the human community sometimes engages it itself with. And so some indigenous animistic societies seek out shamans as a figure uh, capable of employing certain behaviors as a solution to these major problematics uh, or these problems in general of taking lives and eating souls. Because we have to keep in mind that no one wants to die or being killed and, and least of all being eaten, and, and, unless of course uh, there are some humans who have the, the fetish of being killed and even gnawed upon by others. Uh, these are very few cases, but they exist, obviously. But I doubt in nature a bird starts to shout, Oi, listen up, you other creatures of the forest. I want to be killed. That's kind of my kink. Or you don't simply approach a bear and go like, Hey, son, come over here. I've, I've got a, a great deal for you. What about I kill you, feast upon your flesh, give sustenance to my community, Use your bones for tools and your fur will be a very nice coat. What say you? Mate, I don't even talk human. What the hell do you want from me? Leave me alone, you freak. So no one wants to die and or be killed, especially in circumstances of being hunted. From the animistic perspective, this constitutes humiliation for the animal, but also an act the animal won't accept to be justifiable because the animal was injured killed, robbed of its body, or, or its community was also killed and deprived of their physical existence. This is an assault upon the animal and or its community caused by another. So, from the part of the animal whose spirit won't depart with the death of the body, it may want to seek revenge. It may want to force an action that causes damage, harm, and even death to the community of those who have deprived the spirit animal from its physical body in order to find justice or simply avenge itself and its community. Animistic stories, folklore, mythology, cosmology, 
oral ancestral knowledge, etc., is filled with accounts of the origins of death as something that is not desirable and often unexpected. And then a series of problematic events will surface if death isn't dealt with accordingly. So, when hunting, fishing, or other activities that willingly cause the death of animal kin is necessary within an indigenous animistic community, people are aware of the problems this may bring. And we see several behaviors and quite the practical actions to propiti propitiate spirits, to honor the spirit of the animal that has been killed, a careful handle of its bones and burying the bones in the earth to ensure the rebirth of the animal in the next season, a feast in honor of the animal killed, or hunters dressed like other animals to mimic predatory behaviors of other animals and thus trick the animal that is being hunted into believing it wasn't killed by humans, or upon death, human hunters dressed or mimicking behaviors of other animals like wolves, foxes, crows, etc., et to make believe the body is being destroyed by such animals, tricking the spirit of an animal killed in order to seek revenge elsewhere and, and not revenge upon the hunters, or through a series of ritualistic behaviors, propitiating the flesh, bones, and skin of animals, and part of the flesh and some of the bones turned into talismans or other sacred objects, uh, which then are delivered to the natural habitat, gifted to the community of animals the, the hunted and killed animal belong to, or at the very least it requires a decent respectful treatment of the animal's body when it is prepared for consumption as food, or to be turned into clothes or tools and even weapons, or parts of its physical body returned to its natural habitat, uh, be that land or sea, or utterly removed from human consumption etc. A variety of behaviors, right? These behaviors are not spontaneous all the time. It requires the intervention of a shaman to rightly present and instruct which behavior has to be done in order to avoid a greater damage and harm upon the human community. How, when, and where hunting should take place, and uh, which animal is to be hunted, and no other. The shaman is a mediator between persons, so in many cases, it is essential for the shaman to communicate either with the animal or its community or the entity that presides over the community of animals that are usually the ones that can be hunted after the shaman has bargained with and came to an agreement with such community of animals or the entities that preside over such communities. Hunters, in this case, do not hunt at random, but according to the relationships the community has built with land and nature and animal kin through the shaman. And it's, it's also important to re refer that not everyone within the indigenous human community is a hunter or has the right or the job to hunt. Hunters are selected, often by a shaman precisely, who places this task upon certain individuals of the human community. There's a um, control on who the hunter is and who has the, that task to avoid spreading unwanted death and, and harm if everyone takes upon themselves the right to hunt, which can cause great damage upon the human community. If spirits of hunted and killed animals or entities that preside over the community of animal kin that has suffered wrongness cease fit to take revenge upon the human community, for breaking the bargains and relationships and laws that had been established previously when a non-hunter decided to hunt. The shaman itself rarely hunts or does not hunt at all. Surely the shaman occasionally kills certain animals, a specific animals to converse with their spirits. At the sacrifice of a specific animal whose spirit will guide the shaman in a certain task Therefore, sacrifice of an animal here to seek out momentary aid uh, from a helping spirit. So the shaman indeed occasionally causes death. However, it is rare for a shaman to hunt or even to not hunt at all. In many indigenous animistic communities, no one in the community will hunt except hunters who have been chosen for that specific task through a rite of passage, often presided by a shaman, 
which consists in the hunting of an animal that uh, is sacrificed for the purpose. And this sacrifice is arranged by the shaman, either by bargaining with the spirit of the animal or, more often than not, bargaining and reasoning with the entity or entities that preside over the community of the animal that is to be sacrificed and such animal sent forth. Or also, there's occasionally the once human ancestors who repeated the reborn uh, into specific animals and sacrificed themselves in order to feed the human community of their descendants. But the point here is that the hunter or the, the hunters are chosen and their task isn't to just hunt, but instructed into several behaviors in order to prevent harm, damage and death caused by the revenge of an angry spirit that was deprived of its physical body because it was hunted. The hunter becomes the member, uh, that member within the community with very specific tasks and the, the one prepared to deal with the consequences of its actions, mentally, physically and spiritually prepared for the task of hunting and for the right way to propitiate the spirits of the hunted animal kin and to deal with the angry spirit, vengeful spirit, even be willing to be sacrificed to save the human community if things reach a point of such chaos and death and disease and curse upon the human community that the only way to appease the spirits is giving the life of the one who caused injustice and wrongness with its action of hunting. In this way, hunters have an intimate relationship with shamans of their communities. Shamans who bargain and reason with animals and create relationships for mutual help, creating understanding, giving good reasons for the actions of the human community towards animal kin or towards the wider community of life. How to propitiate spirits, how to avoid revenge, how to deal with angry spirits of hunted animals, how to deal with failure in the activity of hunting, creating symbiotic relationships with the wider environments, right? Thus, hunting does not become an activity at random and done at all times or parting from whimsical wishes. In this way, there is a regulation on hunting to preserve both the animal community and the human community and to preserve the wider community of life. So it's not a constant attack upon animal kin but regulated to avoid as much damage, harm and death as possible and to avoid problematic events. So, in many instances, the role of the shaman here is a key element so that the human community may thrive. The shaman persuading animals to allow themselves to be found by hunters and to give up their lives for the good of the human community. The shaman finding a way to bargain and reason with animal kin or with entities that preside over specific environments or communities of animal kin to establish sacrifice. Constructing an idea that hunting and being hunted constitutes sacrifice. And this idea of sacrifice present within the human collective mind is key to avoid extending the killing and death thus avoiding terrible consequences upon the human community. Because hunting isn't understood as a right or an idea that humanity is superior and, and has the, the right to kill lesser lives. What is implicit here within the indigenous animistic uh, mind is that hunting and being hunted is an act of sacrifice. That is, it is unpleasant, unwanted, undesirable and unexpected. Because of this, there's a greater respect for life and, the, and this type of sacrifice is avoided as much as possible and only done when there's no other way, no other choice. While death is unwelcomed, sacrifice, on the other hand, becomes meaningful and sacramental, understood this way. Hunting in animistic societies becomes far more ritualistic to meet the required propitiation of life and maintain the respect for the wider community of life and to maintain and re-establish re -establish, relationships that are fundamental for the well-being and continuation of life. The only animal hunted in an animistic society is the one that the shaman finds suitable. Even so, acts of respect and culturally appropriated forms of respect are offered as well as promises 
and re-establishment of relationships to further establish the respect during and after the killing and death of the hunted animal kin. All these actions are predicted by the forms in which the human community engages with the wider community of life and vice versa. The ability of, of humans to communicate with animals through time and this gathered knowledge through the generations is precisely what constructs the appropriate behaviors and actions that must be taken in order to propitiate the spirits of those who have been untimely and unwillingly deprived or robbed from their physical body. This is one of the major reasons why shamans rarely engage with, or not at all, in the activity of hunting, because they create these relationships in the first place. They gather this information. They are the ones who preside over the culturally appropriated displays and performances of respect. They are mediators who have created these relationships. So it isn't appropriate for them to engage in hunting itself, as it is a disrespect. Think of it as, as if you created a respectful relationship with someone, anyone, and you have established with that person a series of rules and which boundaries you cannot cross, setting up limitations. If you break the rules and cause harm and disrespect to that person, if you break trust, you have to suffer the consequences of such actions. So, in many instances, and in many cultures, the shaman isn't even allowed, it's expressly forbidden, from having any connections with hunting. And this is also one of the reasons why hunters are selected from the community of humans. As pointed out before, the shaman's job is also to converse and establish relationships with entities that preside over a particular region, ground, land, animal kin, or communities of animals. I feel the need to tr try to better explain this situation, lest the, the content develops into misinterpretation. There is this recurrent behavior from the part of the shaman, which is establishing conversations with entities who care for animals, uh, sometimes translated for a better understanding as masters, mistresses, or owners of animals, or communities of animals. Although it's better to not focus on the implications of these terms from the English language, but rather on the idea that certain beings, non-human and non-animal beings, take care or preside over certain animals. Many of these entities are the, the beings or entities that in religious structuring of animist world views would turn into hybrid deities, gods of nature, gods of animals, and so on and so forth. Although we are not here dealing with the divinization or deification of beings, but rather we are dealing with more than human persons, whose nature is being these entities that preside over others. And the relationship between shaman and these entities as the shaman is foremost a mediator between persons, is crucial in the, in the crea creation of relationships between human community and animal kin. These more than human persons decide whether or not hunters will meet and receive animals that they can kill. It is the job of the shaman to converse with such beings and to, to understand their will, what is to be decided, what has been decided and even to bargain with such entities in times of great need. And then the information is passed on to hunters through the shaman. In most cases, the shaman has to promise some form of recompense. Not all recompenses are accepted by the community of humans as the price is, is great, is, is too high. Some recompenses is life for life, meaning a number of human deaths, sacrifices. To, so, so that the, the number of game animals can be released to be hunted. This is important to underline, to have it clear in our minds that hunting isn't really something that takes place all the time or at random or so willingly. A price must be paid for the activity of hunting. Otherwise, there are ter terrible consequences if there's no recompense or if a good reason was established and accepted. So. I think this makes you ponder about the actions of hunters these days, not just trophy hunters and, and hunting for sport, but 
the hunter alone killing without a previous bargain or recompense or a conversation with other than human and more than human persons to establish what is possible to do and how this activity without measure and limitations and rules created all manner of angry spirits seeking revenge and the impact this causes to the environment and by extent to the human communities which are very much part of the wider community of life. This goes for every activity that causes unwilling death to all sorts of animals, obviously including animal agriculture. Let's not forget that we kill 78 billion land animals alone every year. Now think about how many angry souls per year and look at the state of the environment we have these days. Perhaps this helps to understand how much of an animistic mentality we truly need in order to save the environment and by extent save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves at the cost of others' lives. We save ourselves by saving others' lives. If you must eat animals, without a doubt respect is required by both hunters and consumers in the way they deal with animals. Signs of respect that we think are appropriated may not actually be appropriated at all and vengeance taken upon hunter and consumer in many different ways. Of course, there are ways to avert these consequences if we are not familiar with the, the ways on how to properly propitiate the souls of those we have killed and destroyed their physical bodies for our own personal gain. Some actions upon animals and or upon the beings who preside over them cause insult and mediation, apology and recompense is necessary and it, and it is the shaman's job to understand this through conversation with animal kin and beings who preside over animals that have been insulted, hurt or killed. A hunted animal does, doesn't stop to be dangerous just because their physical body is dead. If anything, these spirits may even become more dangerous than they were while inhabiting their physical body. In an animistic worldview, slain animals have to be propitiated. Otherwise, they constitute, uh, or sorry, they, they continue uh, to, to be dangerous because they individually and their kin and community have been insulted and assaulted. It's not just the killed animal that has to be dealt with, but also its community kin and the entities that preside over them when that's the case and all must be persuaded not to take revenge. This perception of life is important so that humanity understands that there's much that remains even after death and that there are consequences and real actions, problems and consequences in general sprouting from unwanted and unwilling death. And that it is simply not possible for humanity to exploit and possess everything. Animals, just like humans, only give what they want to give. When forcibly taken from them, there's consequences. And this is also seen in animistic societies, that it simply isn't possible to take it all, to take what, isn't, what hasn't been given at will. And in the case of hunting or fishing or exploiting the land, when something is taken without culturally appropriated acts of respect and propitiation, humans may find themselves in a situation of not having what they need to exist because it won't be given to them due to their disrespect, continuous disrespect, uh, of taking what they thought they had the right to take. And then there, there are cases of famine, for instance, in animistic communities, when the case of the famine isn't provoked by other humans who exploit land and resources and peoples, of course, obviously. But when the case is the human community taking over what isn't theirs, they may find themselves unable to catch or hunt more because it is taken, taken away due to the injustice, disrespect, insult and assault. For as long as the disrespect continues, the consequences of such actions will only augment suffering and destruction to the point extensive hunting and slaughter of animals brings about even acts of revenge from the part of other than human and more than human persons, be those ancestors, land spirits, or beings who preside over communities. Recompense is given one way or another, through sacrifice, even if it, if it has to be by force. To avoid reaching such a state, shamans exist as mediators between persons. 
even in communities where subsistence requires predatory hunting and consumption of animals, this is something that has to be dealt with carefully, with clear limitations and rules and culturally appropriated performances of respect. The shaman exists here to mitigate as much harm and damage as possible. All these problematic occurrences here spoken really makes us think about our behaviors towards animals and our, con our consumption habits. And the lack of shamans in our modern communities and the terrible lack of an animistic worldview. We have been building up a variety of problems that have not been fixed and constant disrespect, insult and death on animal kin and the wider community of life. Most of us these days has absolutely no idea on how to deal with proper propitiations of souls and we keep eating souls and no recompense given, no sacrifice, no sacramental performances of respect. We have to find solutions for this. The best way for, for societies to avoid these problems is to reduce or even stop with the killing of animal kin. Think about that. I think it's important to share some few words on the romanticism concerning hunting and being a hunter. Precisely because we see a lot of this idea of hunting as something necessary for the survival of humankind, an act constantly performed and portrayed in books, TV series, movies, etc., even to the point of having become an historical fact, as if hunting was always done, always necessary and an activity on a daily basis, which just isn't true. After what I have shared today with you in this video, I think it is very explicit that among indigenous animistic societies, hunting isn't taken lightly. Taking the life of an animal kin or animal persons isn't something glorious or to be proud of and certainly not done regularly as it brings about several problems and terrible consequences and a great effort from the part of human communities to avoid such terrible consequences as was here addressed previously. <laughs> In this channel, uh, I have given an example which I find it to be a good example to illustrate my next few words, which is why I'm, I'm giving it again, which is uh, concerning the activity of hunting itself as a sacramental performance or in a sacramental dimension, often performed to achieve other purposes far beyond its economic role in subsistence. I've given the example before of the aurochs as one of those animals now completely extinct, belonging to the Eurasian megafauna that has been hunted till extinction. And there's a largely misconception here concerning hunting and uh, the need for the human being to hunt in order to have sustenance and to survive. Historically and archeologically speaking, and the several contexts that have been studied throughout human history, show that the great majority of hunting activities have constituted a male rite of passage, an action of imposing male rule over the wild kingdom of nature, a challenge to death itself, and the display of male strength and prowess. Again, I'm not saying that hunting did not serve as another means of sustenance in specific periods and in certain cultural pockets, even to this day. But the fact is that the great majority of hunting activity has served purposes other than a means of sustenance. The great majority of hunting activities um, throughout human history are activities linked to the warrior groups as a form of training and to harden the individual for future battles and to facilitate the killing of another by destroying innocence, as well as to show strength, prowess, manliness, virility, as a performance or a display in a rite of passage when young male individuals become adults and accepted as such within their societies. In other words, a spectacle to demonstrate manliness, showing aspects that were understood to be key elements that build a male character. Now, in both indigenous societies, past or present, and in ancient warrior societies, certain animals become power animals which means they have been seen as particular animals that hold a type of power that human warriors and hunters want to acquire as a power force and even a spiritual ability 
that is absorbed by those who kill the power animal and thus they are infused with such a power that will give them the possibility to become better warriors and better hunters precisely through the absorbance of such a power. In many occasions this spiritual power or ability is the very thing the young warrior and or the hunter is seeking to obtain in order to become an adult, in order to become a man and build up the male character required within the society that person belongs to. I've given this example not just with the orcs but with the, the bear as well. Hunting a bear not for its flesh, not for its for subsistence or, or to have its fur for clothing, but as a sign of manliness, show human prowess, a rite of passage, and to obtain the spirits of the bear to become a stronger and more skillful warrior or hunter. So, in several instances, hunting becomes an activity apart, far beyond the economic role and far from subsistence. Hunting becoming an activity for specific members of the community who seek, through hunting, the power of their animal kin. More often than not, hunting wasn't and hasn't been for the sake of subsistence, unless you either live in an environment uh, completely devoid of flora and impossible to do agriculture and gathering and, and foraging, and therefore the only way is hunting. Or if the territory is invaded by external societies, such as the case of colonialism, which has abruptly changed the lifestyle of indigenous peoples, forcing them to live in restricted areas, losing grounds of natural resources, forced to hunt as the only means of survival. And I think this last point of colonialism is of the utmost importance to bear in mind, because we see a lot of portrayals of, for instance, as an example, Native American indigenous peoples in movies and books hunting all the time. Aside from the obvious biased Western portrayal here to state that indigenous peoples are savages hunting all the time and showing this seemingly brutality as an argument to express inferiority when compared to the Western peoples, it is important to remember that colonization robbed several indigenous peoples of their territories, forcing them to abandon grounds where they did agriculture. They cultivated, they gathered, they foraged for non-animal foods. The very fact that colonization robbed them of their grounds, which by the way, in archaeology we see pre-colonial agriculture and a very intensive network of plantations, very well elaborated and not at all evasive in native indigenous societies, but colonialism destroyed these habits and lifestyle and means of sustenance. And indigenous peoples were forced to live in very geographically reduced environments, pushed away from fertile grounds, and had no other choice but to hunt constantly in order to survive. Not only that, but colonialism also brought a new market of exotic animals, and their physical features being highly coveted by Western societies, such as the case of fur. It opened up a new market of, of fur trade which was quite intense and evasive and absolutely destructive of native fauna. And many indigenous peoples not only were forced to hunt, to hunt even more in order to survive, but also to hunt only to get the fur of many animals, to sell to the colonizers as a means of survival as well, by trading and exchanging for goods they needed to survive, since they had been robbed of such goods on their own grounds. These are important historical factors to take into consideration and why hunting became so important. However, aside from those very specific occurrences, more often hunting was and is engaged for ritual purposes, attaining skills to reassert male and human supremacy or for the entertainment of the nobility and other groups higher in the hierarchy of human communities and not always part of the economy or for subsistence. It's, it's no coincidence that the Eurasian megafauna that presented big horns, antlers or tusks have been hunted till extinction. And so to this day elephants and, and rhinos are one of the most socked animals for hunting activities, for their tusks and horns and not for their meat. 
and tigers as well for their exotic fur and, and not for subsistence or for survival. For human sport and to assert supremacy and male prowess and to show signs of virility, strength and manliness. The aurochs, as one of the, the, the many examples I, I like to give, did not become extinct because human society is needed to hunt to have a means of survival or, or, or sustenance. Like so many of Europe's megafauna, the aurochs met their end at the hands of humans because their horns were highly coveted as hunting trophies. And since animism, indigenous worldviews and neo-pagan thinking are so similar to one another when dealing with uh, the wider community of life and respect life and its persons, I think by now this should be common knowledge among neo-pagans. Neo-paganism has been on the rise and, and people starting to be more attentive and aware uh, to the environment and the impact humanity has had upon life and uh, upon nature and the world. The largest group of neo-pagans in the Western societies are Wiccans. So Wiccans by now, at the very least, should know it better by now. Precisely concerning the, the great focus on, on this neo-pagan religious manifestation and also a great focus, historically speaking, concerning the, the, the pre-Christian societies Wicca has drawn inspiration from. A great focus around horned deities and the, the coveted horns and antlers of animals for religious purposes and rites of passage or initiation rites. Not hunting such animals for sustenance and survival, but because of their horns that present a variety of religious connotations such as fertility, strength, and signs of male prowess and human dominion over nature. Think about how this single factor becomes absurd when past societies honored horned deities of nature by killing animals to rob them of their horns and give, gift those horns to the deities protectors of nature and those animals. And I'm not now only speaking about Wiccans, I'm speaking in historical terms of past societies. Right here outside, there's a famous mountain that since the Paleolithic, to this day actually, unfortunately, people gift animals' horns to the gods and spirits that inhabit the mountain. Horned deities who preside over animals and the wild kingdom of nature. This systemic behavior has had terrible consequences on the, the native fauna, especially on endangered species, now endangered species, such as the mountain goat. Just because it has been done for thousands of years doesn't mean it is right. Just because it has been normalized doesn't mean it is right either. Look at all the things humanity has done that was normalized and considered appropriate, appropriate once. And at some point in history we have stopped doing it because it simply doesn't make sense anymore. And uh, causes uh, more harm and damage than anything productive. If it was once right and normal to sacrifice children to certain gods, why aren't we doing it today? A rhetorical question, obviously. Another point that may have come to your mind that we need meat to survive. It's a biological thing and if it wasn't for meat, we would never have evolved. So is it true that meat was responsible for human evolution? Well, it isn't certain and that is one of many hypotheses and for some reason became so widespread that is taken as a fact. Did meat really help humans evolve? Well, recent studies have found that this common belief, whose details sprouting from a theory were never fully taken into consideration, isn't as sound as it once was. And it is the product of a very common mistake when it comes to social human sciences. This happens all the time. And I, I am more than familiar with it as I am an archaeologist. Tired of being an archaeologist, sure, certainly, but I'm still an archaeologist. This happens in historical studies, archaeology, anthropology, several fields of human social sciences, which is focusing on a single context and transport that information to a global level as, as if every pocket of society was the reflection of that single context being studied. This is a grave mistake. In the case of the hypothesis of meat having been the key factor for human evolution, well, paleoanthropologists have focused too much on famously well-preserved sites in places like uh, Holovai Gorge, 
uh, where it was found evidences of early humans eating meat and a sudden explosion of meat eating um, two million years ago. These are some very specific contexts in which animal bones have been found with scraping marks of, of stone tools to prepare or, or, or to separate flesh from bone to be consumed. These specific contexts were turned into the mirror of human evolution all over the place. There's a clear human evolution in this context concerning Homo erectus, surely. The problem is that the numbers don't add up. And we find human evolution in several other contexts that do not present a large consumption of meat. In fact, there are several contexts of a rapid human evolution that simply do not present animal remains. And there's a far greater consumption of plant foodstuff. The narrative of meat made as human is an evolution, evolutionary narrative that is starting to fall down as new evidences, evidences and studies show that there's been a great quantity of evidences that there's no evidence that meat eating had a role to play in human evolution. While there was an increase in marked animal bones after the advent of, human, uh, with, of Homo erectus in some contexts, this was likely because sites from this time period had been more extensively studied and sampled. It's important to investigate and take into consideration other explanations and other contexts for the anatomical and behavioral differences that started to appear with Homo erectus. Because these specific contexts are not the reflection of the entirety of human evolution. There's actually other very plausible factors that led to a rapid human evolution, one of which is the development of controlled fire for cooking, as humanity started to be able to eat a lot more natural products because cooking turned several materials into edible foods, not only mitigating the amount of bacteria, but most importantly, soften a lot of food and it is easier to eat and digest, giving humanity a lot more nutrients. And it's not just meat, but several plant food stuff. Humans are not naturally born predators. We did not evolve to obtain fangs and claws. Humans become predators by the tools we have created that helps humans to hunt through objects external to the human physical structure. Fire was an important achievement to cook food and consume a, a greater variety of natural products, including a lot more plants. It is often a mistake to think that humanity only started to eat plants due to a Neolithic revolution. Plants have always, always existed, and humanity has always eaten them. The ones they could gather, forage, and even harvest at several early points of human evolution. Besides, as previously said, humans are not natural predators on their own. Humans can't tear flesh by hand, can't tear hide by hand. Humans wouldn't have been able to deal with food sources that require large canines before we came up with tools to do it. The seasonal settlements and the early stages of agriculture that we see is just the domestication of plants and centered in environments occupied by humans. But humanity has always eaten plants, especially in times when humanity was physically unable to kill animals for sustenance when there were no tools for it. And another factor that may have led to the evolution of humanity was socializing. Fire didn't just help in cooking foods. As humanity progressively has a better control of fire, it also coincides with larger gatherings of humans in groups and interaction with several other pockets of human species. The simple action of sharing information, knowledge, development of communication, interaction between humans, sharing forms of expression other than speech, but also drawing, construction of tools, sharing experiences and, and advice. Fire brought this and helped humans to evolve. In other words, socializing is a far greater factor that helped humanity to evolve than the simple consumption of meat. Fire allowed us to cook foods that would have previously been hard to digest, such as wild grains and tubers. And another factor is potatoes. <laughs> as humanity was able to cook food, it was actually introduced a lot more plant food stuff uh, than meat. So plants 
are just as responsible for human evolution as meat may have been. But potatoes, more than most other plants or a plant-based diet, and certainly far better than meat in this case of human evolution. It is both an historical and scientific fact that animals made up only a, pro a portion of the prehistoric diet. The paleo diet we hear so much about mainly consisting in meat is bullshit. I've literally been in several prehistoric contexts. This isn't at all true. Not to mention that the theory that our brains developed as a, as a consequence of us, us hunting and eating meat, that's also not true. It is quite possible that the consumption of foods such as potatoes was actually responsible for the growth of our brains. Our brains use around 20 to 25 percent of all of our energy. And because the body's main source of energy is glucose, consuming foods high in carbohydrates would have been highly beneficial for our cognitive development. Not just potatoes, but as previously said, wild grains and tubers which are some of the most carbohydrate-dense foods in the planet. Basically, human evolution and the evolution of human brain and its cognitive capacities came from fire, socializing, and having a rich plant-based diet, which is far more common to find this in the archaeological record than a high consumption of meat. Think about that. Taking into consideration that for indigenous animistic peoples it is problematic to kill and eat the flesh of those like us, animals who are seen as kin and as possessing souls like we do, and that it is problematic the consumption of their souls and using their physical remains for clothing and utensils, I have often asked the question if indigenous peoples want to become vegan in order to avoid these problems. Yes, veganism is a new term coined around the 1940s of the 20th century, but it is a new term for a long-lasting tradition of having solely a plant-based diet. Even though I'm not going to right now on this video, not today, <laughs> focus on the several cultural backgrounds that have presented solely a plant-based diet throughout the historical continuity of the existence of such cultures, and without pointing out the several moments of human history when humanity ate more plant foodstuff than animals, it is important to remember that several indigenous societies to this day, on a cultural and religious basis, are either fully turned to a plant-based diet or incorporate more fruits and vegetables in their diets than meat. However, there are obviously indigenous societies that find themselves in severe environments uh, where it is impossible to farm, gather and forage for plant food, and they must resort to hunting or fishing. However, we live in a globalized world where it has become much easier for humanity to have access to products that are not endemic to specific lands or regions and environments. Still, Many people could have access to a, a variety of products, but this doesn't happen in every community because, unfortunately, several indigenous communities are subject to the laws and to the systems of governance of the people and nations that have colonized them. Even though nowadays the, the process of colonization isn't as active as once was during the modern age, the effects of colonization are still very much active and still provoke a lot of problems and systematic damage to indigenous peoples. So, could veganism solve the problem of animistic indigenous societies when it comes to the consumption of animal kin and the consumption of their souls? I've contacted several indigenous peoples, quite a few, some of which I have maintained a strong and healthy relationship with, Others I have been able to contact through others, through, through other people. But most indigenous persons on the list I have gathered and their thoughts concerning veganism, I didn't even have to contact them and, and speak with them uh, as nowadays. Fortunately, their voices are being heard on several social media networks and also through book publishing. So what are their thoughts concerning veganism as a solution for, for these matters? Well, not surprisingly, their moral principles and indigenous lifestyle goes very much in line with veganism. 
And even though some don't feel like going full vegan at the moment, but agree on adding a, a lot more plant food to their diets and reduce on meat consumption, the great majority of, of the cases want to be vegan. But what stops them from, being, from becoming vegan? Well, the problem is the exact same. The laws and governance of the, the countries they have been subjected to. I'm not going through all the examples, so I will pick one so you may have an idea of what is going on. The case of uh, Inuit people as members of an indigenous nation that inhabit the Arctic regions of Canada, Alaska and, uh, and Greenland. Historically speaking, uh, there are, these are territories uh, where it, it is quite hard to farm and to have a plant-based diet all year round. However, nowadays, as I've said, it would have been possible for everyone on the planet to have access to a variety of foods from different regions of the globe. We go into the supermarket and, and, and there it is. You are eating tomatoes and potatoes in Europe. You are eating bananas in Scandinavia, eating watermelons in, in Asia, eating um, cabbages and carrots in Africa, etc. The problem here is that not every indigenous peoples have access to these products. Not because they live in areas where you cannot grow this food because that's no longer an excuse, as previously pointed out, not nowadays, but because governments do not allow indigenous peoples to have access to these products. In the case of Inuit people, I have talked with some, uh, but seen and heard a lot more through social media networks and, and the books where they um, express their thoughts. Inuit people that are um, under the governance of the United States of America and or Canada only have very few, very, very few supermarkets in their areas, which have been set there not for indigenous peoples, but for non-indigenous peoples living in the area. So indigenous peoples hardly have access to these spaces because it's not for them. However, these are super... There are supermarkets for them, but the food is highly selected by the government. So they do not have access to a variety of products, but only to the products the government want indigenous people to have access to. On top of all of that, the products within supermarkets for indigenous peoples are far more expensive than the exact same products in supermarkets for non-indigenous peoples. And on top of all of that, the Inuit and other indigenous nations pay more taxes than any other person in Canada or the United States and so on and so forth. They pay more taxes than non-Indigenous peoples. So the scheme here is to not allowing Indigenous peoples to have the same access and pay the same prices as everybody else. Even though they would like to be vegan or at the very least include more plants and vegetables and fruits in their diets, they are not allowed to do that by the governments and laws to which they are subjected to. And this is just one example. This happens to other indigenous peoples across the globe. So when people say that ah, indigenous peoples would never go vegan because in their culture, hunting and fishing is a way of life, which I won't argue that it has a certain cultural weight. And indeed, due to the fact that before they lived in spaces in which it was, a, it was hard to have a plant-based diet. But nowadays, it is quite different. And even though they want to have access to several products and change their diets, and some even want to become fully vegan, they are not allowed to. Not by their culture, cultural standards, uh, not because of their religious systems, not because of their cultural history and moral principles and hunting and fishing that constituted religious activities beyond the economic and the subsistence scope, but because the countries to which they are subjected to and forced to live in and forced to obey such laws that go completely against the laws of land and nature to which indigenous peoples have been connected to for over a millennia, such countries do not allow them to have access to other products and basic human needs. This is something to think about. Indigenous peoples, animistic people, neo-pagans and vegans have very similar thoughts concerning the environment and the laws of land and nature. Poverty, famine, war, 
speciesism and the ecocide and such other assaults on life, nature and the environment is the result of notions of certain human societies that lie in the core of the assumption that the human being is superior than other persons of the world, leading to the exploitation of land and persons, be those human or non-human persons. We live in an interrelated world, therefore every damage and harm caused to one living being or to a community of living beings will result in endangering everyone involved in the interrelated web of life. Humanity isn't an isolated species, but rather each human is an integral member of the wider community of life. And we cannot separate ourselves from the, from, from the world and its persons. As soon as this understanding is once again implemented within every human community, we will be able to find better ways to mitigate the damage, harm, destruction, death we have been creating. It's no coincidence that indigenous peoples are, nowadays still are, responsible for protecting and preserving at least 80% of the world's animal, um, animal species and that a fully plant-based diet started within indigenous societies as a solution to minimize as, as much harm and damage as possible to other living creatures who are, after all, our kin. All right, my dear friends, I do hope this video was useful. I very much hope this made you, at the very least, think a little bit about the reality of our world, our history and our societies, and ponder about the impact humanity has had over the wider community of life. Eat more carbohydrates and become wiser than what you already are. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> See you on the next video. And as always, I for you. Thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje. Farewell, my dear friends.